Hey, everybody. Thanks for making it out tonight. Um, so we have a very exciting lineup. Um, many thanks to Stripe for hosting. Um, a huge thanks to Jen Campbell and Edwin Wee and Cynthia Gildea and Mark and Tamara and the whole Stripe team for hosting us today. Uh, amazing job. So thank you. Um, so this first panel is all around AI dev tools. Um, there's been an enormous amount of effort in this area recently. And as this new technology is being adopted, a whole new stack of tooling is being built out for different people to use. And so today what we were hoping to do was talk with some of the leading companies in the area, as well as um, uh, you know also have the customer view simultaneously represented by Mike from Zapier. And so um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the panelists rather than have each person do like a very long intro, which usually just chews into time. And um, somebody in the audience really appreciates that. Um, and uh, uh, then we're gonna uh, dive into some um, Q&A that I have ready, and then we'll turn it over to the audience in the last 15 minutes for any questions that folks may have. So thanks again, everybody, for making it. Um, so I'll start on that end. Um, Mike is uh, co-founder, um, president running AI for Zapier. They're the leader in easy automation and their mission is to make automation work for everyone. And I'm sure many of the developers here have used Zapier for different things over time. Um, Jerry, who's sitting next to me, is the CEO and co-founder of Llama Index. Prior, he was at Robust Intelligence, Uber, and Quora in ML engineering and engineering management roles. And Llama Index is an open source tool that provides a central data management and query interface for your LLM application. And then we have um, Tuhin Srivastava from Base10. He was co-founder of Shape before and an ML engineer at Gumroad. And Base10 allows engineers to serve models of any size for every modality and serve them performantly, scalably, and cheaply for production use cases. So thanks all of you for joining today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'll start uh, off with a question to Mike and then open it up to the broader panel. Um, it'd be great to hear a little bit about how um, Zapier has been uh, adopting AI and how it's providing it to its users, and also a little bit just in terms of what what tooling do developers need for AI that's still missing or nascent or early. Cool, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd say like um, ostensibly heard to talk about developer tooling, and I guess one perspective I'd have is the sort of distance between developer and non-technical business user is very it's been collapsing over the last ten years, and it's certainly accelerated in the last twelve months. Uh, at this point, I think we've got over 100,000 AI use cases running on Zapier every single day. And uh, most of Zapier's customers are not technical. They're not developer. They would not self-describe themselves as an engineer or a developer. And yet, they are building with language models into more traditional workflow automation inside sort of internal operations use cases around, around their businesses, around their teams, and things like that. So what we've been sort of observing from our customers as they've been trying to adopt language models is like, you know, they're, they're sort of one step behind the front end developers who are like having to build with the raw APIs. And they're looking for easier to use tools on top of that to figure out, okay, how can I actually pull, you know, the power of language models into sort say like a sales qualification, you know, work workflow use case or a customer summarization use case or drafting a follow-up to like a lead. And a few of the like missing tools I'd say at this point, you know, we, we were one of the launch partners for the ChatGPT plugin and um, you know, our thesis at the time was language models are, are great, but they're sort of frozen in time. They can't take action in the real world. So that was our first thesis was like, let's equip them with the ability to go out and perform state changes um, on sort of uh, API data. And what we learned is it's that's incomplete. Um, I do think it's part of the problem, but what's missing is the like retrieval side of that use case, because most workflows, if you think about you and how you use SaaS software and jobs uh, in your own jobs, you probably don't just like sit at a command line and say like, create data X, create data Y, go do Z, right? You are often needing to like pull in information or filter existing data that exists in those tools, make a decision about it, maybe filter the data, search for like a certain thing that you found like three weeks ago, and then make a decision or an operation decision or an action decision sort of on that data. So that's one big missing piece of the stack right now, I think is business users are like really, really demanding the ability to use language models to access and retrieve over their actual business data. That's like a big missing sort of capability gap. And both the developer side, because uh, we would be buying it if it existed, but it doesn't, so we're having to build it. But certainly for the end user on the business side as well, because they're wanting to pull these tools into their own sort of workflows. Um, you know, but besides that, I would say the other big gap that we're seeing right now is around self-hosting. Um, I know actually, we, <laughs> maybe I'm giving a tee up for for you two in here, uh, but that's a that's another big demand we're hearing from a lot of business users and non-technical users is just the sort of hesitations and fears around um, like training and 
I think for most business users, they use the word training as um, like they don't even have the technical understanding of the distinction between fine tuning and training. They just see all usage of bringing custom data into a language model or an AI agent as training. Um, and there's this hesitancy to sort of adopt a lot of third party tools and intelligence layers because of that. Um, so solving that, I think, is going to be another big important problem. It's just to sort of see mass business user adoption of this stuff. That's actually a great transition over um, if you want to comment to and a little bit on the hosting side, and then we can get to and more generally sort of where you see yeah. things missing, and then we can talk to Jerry about uh, uh, additional stuff. Yeah, for sure. I think we, we kind of see it from a very specific place where, you know, we don't really work with many customers working with, you know, GPTs. Otherwise, it's a lot of customers coming, trying to use open source models, um, either because it's cheaper, either because you know, they need to run it on their own premise, or frankly, because it's just a different type of model that, that doesn't exist. Um, and for those um, set of models, I think, honestly, there's a lot of tools, but not so many um, tools that are working with large models um, that, that are performant, cheap, scalable, and all those things. And, you know, the reason for that is like everything kind of changed six or seven months ago, you know, deployment was commoditized or kind of ML 1.0 for this new set of models. Things are a bit bigger. It's hard to run 40 billion parameter models. It's hard to bit run them on your own infrastructure. It's hard to run them in the cloud. It's hard to run them scalably. It's hard to fine tune them. And so really like the way I like to think about it is, you know, I look at on the kind of like front end stack a bit um, and look at Vercel and they kind of took this front end package and any story, user story you can think of around using that front end package, Vercel tries to power that. Um, so I think any any um, user story you can think of around a trained machine learning model or even a, a model that requires further tuning or training, um, honestly, it's there to be rebuilt. There's not that many customers, a, any um, products just work off the shelf, you know, just to give a quick landscape, you know, you've got the really big cloud providers that don't have the developer ergonomics there to make it work. You have kind of like the companies that were founded, you know, 20, 2015 to 2020 that really aren't suited to this type of data and this type of machine learning model. And then you kind of have the ups, you know, the startups. Um, and that's really where, you know, I see a lot of the gap and where we're building. And um, is there anything that you think more broadly is a need in terms of other parts of the developer stack or tooling that people need or other things that you view as sort of missing gaps? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, we're really focused on inference. Um, you know, I think there are a bunch of cool companies in inference and um, I think we're doing some cool stuff obviously as well. Um, on the training side, you know, Mosaic was doing cool stuff, but, you know, it re really, I think that's open again, to be honest, it's unsolved and if you talk to, if we talk to 10 customers in a day, what we find is not any one of them is doing training exactly the same way. Um, so I think there's a ton of opportunity there. And I think the biggest, the biggest one after that I hear, um, is around debugability, um, during training and inference. And, um, there's some cool stuff popping up around evals right now. I think there's a huge opportunity there. Okay, great. And then Jerry, do you want to talk a little bit about both? what you folks are doing and then other missing needs that you feel exist? Yeah, I mean, I think some of this relates to, to Mike's points as well. I, I think there's like a spectrum of like LM software systems being built um, all the way from kind of like read only capabilities around like sort of drum retrieval, like the QA or chatbot over your PDFs. I'm sure you guys have seen like a million of these. Um, all the way to kind of like agents and auto GPT and stuff that's a bit more autonomous and can make actions and, and, and modify state in the world. Um, I, I do think like the latter stuff is like cool for demos, but I, I feel like for production use cases, a lot of like companies I've talked to are, are kind of still a little bit wary of doing that just because the moment you like start trusting these things to modify state, then you have to be a bit more careful about like the, the stuff that it can unleash, right? Whereas if it's just like a, you know, read only setting, then, you know, the worst that you're going to get is like a bad output. And then you can just go in and, and actually find the answer after. Um, so I think like, um, oh, there's like a lot of, uh, like, I think one of the things that is like, uh, cool these days is that it's very easy for anybody to just like set up any sort of like QA system over their data, uh, taking like GPT or an open source model or a fine tuned model, and then just plug it in with a vector database. And also I think as, as Mike said, I think a lot of business users just also see this as like training, even though it's not really training, you're just like adding on like a data layer to it. Um, but I think like as people start like actually tuning the, these applications for production use cases, 
you're starting to see like there's a lot more uh there's like a long tail of things you're gonna have to solve to actually improve the performance of these things right like how do you actually do like document parsing extraction how do you actually like uh, structure the data in the right way whether in a vector database or in a structured database or, or how do you model different types of data and how do you have like a combined good retrieval algorithms with the llm and then um kind of then later on think about like latency and cost and all these things and then i think the, the last point uh, i don't know, like um, like what base is doing is like, there, there's still this like unexplored question of just like, you know, what is ex exactly is the, the trade-off between, uh, like fine tuning and, and also like uh, rack system, right? Like most people would start with the latter, but like that might also just be like a lot of these tools around training are less accessible to, to users right now. Can I add one more thing actually? It's just like broad market observation over the last 10 years. It certainly seems like inference is starting to take over more and more of like deterministic software, you know, starting back in like the 2010s where we we're just doing like image recognition through pattern recognition with large like deep neural nets up through sort of language models where you're starting to get maybe real reasoning and intelligence layers. And if you sort of assume that it's going to continue, and uh, I don't have any reason to doubt that that's going to continue, how you like work with software, I think does very fundamentally change. Um, you know, it's not deterministically, hey, I put X in and got Y out of this function. It is, I put X in and sometimes I get Y out, but sometimes I get Z out. And like, as a both a developer and for like users of business users of just using software, I do think that more software is going to look like teaching software and like educating software versus configuring software. So if you think you're going through, you know, like a setup flow for a more traditional piece of SaaS software, like a CRM that you use or like a chat, you know, Slack or team chat or something, I think more and more it's going to look like, hey, I'm going to like tell the software what exactly I want from it and how I want it to work for me and what maybe even, you know, tone it takes on and what it pays attention to and doesn't. And I don't think it's going to be one shot. I think that's going to have to come with like a feedback loop where you have to course correct it. It might do something wrong and you're going to have to say, oh no, don't do that anymore. That was really, really bad. Maybe it does something like, okay, and you're, you just ignore it. Or maybe, you know, think about it four days later, like, hey, maybe that one wasn't the best, but it's not, you know, mission critical to get it wrong. And that does feel that like feedback mechanism. Of, I've not seen almost anyone working on the user layer. There are a few folks, and I'll throw a bone back to you a lot, starting to work on this in the developer layer, like a brain trust to sort of give developers a way to measure the performance of their sort of black box, black box, both inference and more classic, like deterministic software, they roll together to deliver use case, but you're getting these feedback signals from users on, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. If it was bad, here's why and we're going to need a way to like feed those back into that black box of, all right, how do we actually, you know, improve this black box to actually get more likely to get more thumbs ups over time. Um, that feedback loop is very, very nascent today, even on the technical side. Yeah, it's really interesting. Somebody I was talking to earlier today basically phrased it as um, everybody basically has a, a stochastic genie now that they're interacting with and how do you keep the genie in the bottle is sort of like how they talk about LLMs. And I thought that was a really interesting, almost like analog in terms of you moving from um, deterministic to non-deterministic systems in some ways. And so how do you, to your point, create that feedback loop, I think is really key. Um, it, you raise an interesting point too as well, which it'd be interesting to hear how people think about it which I feel like the role of the ML engineer is shifting and the role of the data scientist is shifting. And, you know, there's a blog post recently that started talking about like the AI engineer. And, you know, uh, there, there's there been similar changes in terms of data engineers and DBT or other sorts of shifts in roles and roles that exist. So I'm sort of curious, like, what do you think the roles of the future will be even a year or two out in terms of interacting with these models, the organization around it, the types of people who do it, that kind of thing? Sure. Yeah, I can I can take a stab at this. Um, I think, um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I have like a tweet thread on this too, but I, I think like, yeah, it'd probably be a mix of like, I think everybody is going to have to understand AI to some capacity. Um, I think that's quite important. And and what's more like uh, oper uh, understanding some like best ops practices around like, how do you really manage and evaluate like a stochastic system, right? And that's actually one of the cool uh, core toolkits of like any data scientist or any MLE is that you know you train this like supervised classification model you have to go and evaluate it after and really like figure out how do you just like make sure it re, uh, you know it like uh, hits like the right accuracy bars or like on tensorboard you can see the like loss curves going down you can really make sure this is good and i think there's a lot of challenges and and um, that's almost like a separate topic of discussion i think there are some core software principles that everyone is going to have to understand too especially with respect to stochastic systems and uh one thing that i've become very interested in recently is this idea of like a good API design practices, right? Like if you're a software engineer, you need to understand API design, um, especially if you're designing any service that like communicates between each other. And usually when there are like two computer systems, you like design a very kind of like uh, rigorous programmatic interface with like a strict 
kind of like variables and this is like clear as in like this service does this, this service does this, and they can communicate with each other. There's a layer of complexity though, because a lot of times these days it's like, you know, it's like a LLM interacting with a service or like uh, you're interacting with an LLM. And I think um, if you look at, for instance, just one example, like the agent tools paradigm, like it just being able to design like a proper API interface uh, between like, for instance, like a stochastic system and something that's deterministic is not super solved yet. And I do think um, that, you know, as these models get better and as these limitations come out, more and more like AI engineers are going to have to really like design these systems to, but you know, the goal of the AI engineers is to build a software system around LLM. And I think that's going to be a core part of the toolkit. Yeah, I can add on that. Um, I think that that seems pretty aligned with what we're seeing. One thing we track, we recruit um, pretty heavily um, from the tech fairs at you know MIT, Stanford, et cetera. And we track interest in AI or their focus areas. Um, I think three years ago, AI was you know probably thirty percent as the top interest area, and now it's well over ninety percent. I, I I think what is interesting there is that. Yeah, to me, what we're seeing is that the most effective engineers know the the most effective engineers at shipping AI products or AI enabled products are the ones engineers who know ML. It's not data scientists. It's not you know machine learning researchers. It's the people who understand that this is now just a part of the core um, toolkit, and you're gonna have to understand how to how to relate to that. Whether that's with off the shelf APIs or whether that's um, with open source models. But it's really just another, um, you know, if you know data, it's just like databases. It's now machine learning is another one of these things. I can represent sort of the customer side here a little. Um, we back in uh, March did a sort of top down code red for the company. We said for everyone in the company, we take a week off of your day job and we're going to do a hackathon. And we this was open to every single person, not just technical uh, and engineering product, but cross the work, sales, CS, IT, ops, you name it. And we said, go learn this technology. You have to, this is like existential. We have to figure out what can language models do for non-technical business users and what can they not do? And we sort of challenged folks to say, go figure out it for your own job. And at this point, we've actually got over a third of the entire company now at Zapier is using AI in a autonomous workflow in some way. This is not like, you know, going to a command line and using an actual language, but like it's built into sort of an internal IT or operational workflow that, that we have at this point. And you know, when we started doing that, there was a very common thing I would hear is, um, you know, there's, there's a sort of like latent fear of, uh, like, Ooh, what happens if I don't figure this out? Like, is this, is my sort of job on the line? If, you know, if we don't figure this out, do we need to like reduce costs? What, you know, there's, there's very, very common sentiments. I, I totally get them. Um, and I would sort of maybe take, uh, look at it through a different lens. Like, I think that sort of starts from a status quo of today. And I think if you jump ahead 10 years and assume a status quo, the future looking back, the sort of skill set of knowing what can language models do and not do is going to just become an assumed skill set for most knowledge workers. Like those are going to be the folks who sort of rise to the top. Those are going to be the folks that get promoted. Those are going to be the folks that lead teams. Those are going to be the folks that hire and build teams. I think that's going to be this sort of, skill, sort of assumed skill set. So I do think there's a lot of like individual incumbents today to like learn the technology and figure out what is possible to do and, and equally what it can't do. Cause that's also a really, really big factor of figuring out where can you actually deploy this stuff. And as we've sort of brought that sort of, um, I guess, perspective into our customer base, it's been resonating a lot too. And um, that's been one of the, I, I think, ways that we've been trying, we've been trying to help other companies sort of accelerate the adoption of, of AI and automation into their own teams. Well, so one of the things that was raised earlier on the panel, and I think it'd be good to um, maybe start with Jerry on this in terms of broader um, data needs in the LLM world. But, you know, I attended a, a dinner recently where there was um, a dozen different people running ML teams from different companies and fine tuning, fine tuning came up, and the question came up of how many people are doing fine tuning. And out of the dozen, I think one person was doing it, and it's because they had a large scale consumer product, and so they just had like an enormous amount of like data and input. How important is that? And more generally, how do you think about what's important from a data centric perspective for for these technologies? Yeah, I um, to be honest, I don't actually have a great answer to this. Uh, we'd be curious to hear other people's thoughts too. Um, I think like that it is like a fact that these days, uh, like a retrieval augmented system is way easier to get started with. Uh, in Lama Index, you can get started with like three lines of code. Basically, you just like load in some data, put in a vector database, connect it to your like pre-trained language model. It's just a, a lot nicer. Uh, or, or sorry, you can just like get a QA system really quickly. Um, 
I do think just like theoretically speaking, like um, fine tuning has a lot of like very nice properties because like um, to some extent, a lot of like how you wire like a data pipeline into an LLM info prompt is kind of like a hack. Like you're trying to figure out like the best way to do some sort of retrieval. And then you're trying to just like stuff stuff into the prompt. Um, whereas part of like the beautiful things about these language models, if you just open up like ChatGPT, is like it can just do like general reasoning because you just threw like a ton of data at it and it can like generally understand everything like within its like training corpus, right? And in a very holistic manner. So you don't need to like worry about these software systems. I, I, so we're like tracking the developments of fine tuning honestly pretty closely. Uh, we're, we're like playing around with it ourselves. We're, like we're excited about models that can kind of do like, um, like that that can be fine tuned very very cheaply and 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 um the, the the main thing though is that like um a lot of like the kind of like barriers right now is that if you look at like the fine tuning api for open ai it's not very good um and then also um gpt4 on its own is actually like probably the best model these days especially for kind of like agent like reasoning and i think that's what's captivating folks to basically just go out and just use this thing as a reasoning engine and build these like rack systems but i i do think like um like as you know, there's a huge incentive for open source models uh, to get better and also fine tuning to get better. And I could see uh, both of them like complementing each other, right? I feel like there will probably always be a need for some sort of general reasoning and lookup of information, but how like a model is able to be improved uh, like in response to feedback and also incorporate like domain knowledge over time, um, fine tuning could totally be the answer. I think you raise an interesting point, which is um, at what point do you just want to prototype or build on GPT-3 or on, or for uh, or Anthropic or you know some of the other um, APIs versus build something yourself? And so maybe too, and you can tell us a little bit more about what you view as that path from you know um, off the shelf uh, open source models. When should you use them versus not? Why should you use them? And how you should approach it? Yes, yeah, good question. Um, I think I think everyone should start there, right? It it, it is it's kind of foolish not to start um, at you know, these close, pretty performant models that are better, for the most part, are better than anything we know exists in the open source right now. Um, what we see from customers is that um, they they get pretty far with that and then they realize that they need to migra migrate off um, for a number of reasons, either for costs, for performance, for, um, you know, they want a more specific model for something, you know, company a customer validators. Uh, writer.com, which is kind of like Jasper AI for the enterprise. And they have a couple of like healthcare models. Um, and, you know, they're very, very specific. And, you know, there's a migration path there where they started with the closed source and now they're going to the open source. Um, I think that's a really good way to start. I, I think the truth, though, is, is that, you know, fine tuning is very, very difficult. And so, like, the, the natural path probably is, you know, go to something like GPT, get your data set together go and fine tune something, go and find something off the shelf that looks okay, and then fine tune it. Um, it's pretty hard still. I, I, I think, you know, if I, if I reflect on cus like chats I've had with customers about this, I'd say, you know, nine out of 10 um, mid-market or enterprise customers want to fine tune models. Less than one out of 10 um, has actually done it successfully. I think, you know, there's very few people who have done it successfully. And so I think, there's a massive gap there, but I think most importantly, you know, we've dabbled here as well and we watch it very closely. And what we realized pretty recently, that's still very much a research problem. Um, and there's no real science to it just yet. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, Harrison from LangChain had a pithy quote on this for startups where he said, no GPU until product market fit. And it's basically like, until you know the thing works, like don't go and, you know, build your own models and deal with that. Yeah, it's very, it's very, it's both very expensive and hard. I think that is the way the world will go. Um, but yeah, no GPUs to a product market fit makes sense. Do you want to add? I, I regretfully say this as like, you know, an engineer, but like users just don't care about the technical details of how your AI system is implemented. Um, at the end of the day, fine tuning, self-hosted, retrieval, augmented stuff, like you, what do you, they don't care about that. They care about like, is it cheap? Is it low latency? Does it actually solve my problem? So I think you know, on, on our side, you know, on the builder side, then it's more about like, well, which tool do you use to like get the right set of trade-offs? And that's where I think stuff like Harrison's totally right on the first side. When you're like navigating the product space, you want fast iteration cycles and, you know, you don't have scale. So it's fine if you're, you know, paying a thousand bucks a day for an intelligence layer for a few weeks while you like work through the idea space. But once you got something working and you actually want to drive down latency, you know, you want to drive down cost per token, um, then I think fine tuning does make sense. I, I will say we're not doing any fine tuning right now for, for our stuff though. Um, 
I'd say most people in the industry are still working through the product market fit stage, stage for most AI products. It seems like um, one other thing that Silicon Valley tends to do a lot besides, you know, immediately rush to build its own models, which is always very fun and exciting, is um, really focus on the developer use case first and PLG based distribution and all the various aspects of not having to deal with big buyers. Um, what do you think is the thing that's most missing for larger enterprises to adopt LLMs versus individual devs? The biggest thing? I mean, the biggest thing we hear hesitancy around is I don't know how to actually get my employees to figure out real use cases for it. Like there's so much noise in the market that I don't know what's worth paying attention to and what's not. Like there's a new startup, there's 10 new startups every day. <laughs> so like help me be a curator of like what's actually useful and what will actually help my company like get an outcome I care about. And then the second one is the hesitancy is around the training stuff. And I use training in a broad sense of just like, I don't know where my data is going to go when I, once I start, you know, giving authentication and copying paste data into these, these tools. So solving those two things, I think is, those are some of the biggest ones that, that I hear on a weekly basis. Um, just to chime in that, um, I think that makes sense. You know, they're still figuring out, like, I think, um, me and someone, me and Baron actually were just talking on the way over here of how, you know, you could spend, you could make quite a lot of money just going and educating enterprises on how to use AI. How much will they pay for a one day workshop? on AI. I didn't think they know just quite how to use it yet. Data and privacy come up. I think there is a lot of concerns around piping data um, to chat GPT. Um, I think, so it's kind of this trade-off where you have this data privacy on one hand, and on the other hand, there's not that many great solutions for self-hosting your models um, across multiple clouds. You know, that's what we're hearing um, from customers is that, you know, we, we work with Okay. We work with Stability AI and, you know, they're a larger customer in this whole kind of space in terms of spend at least. And they have four different clouds they're trying to operate across to use up all the compute credits, I think. Procter & Gamble is another company that we're working with who has, you know, for one team, they have two Azure clouds, one AWS cloud, one GCP cloud. Um, and that is a real pain. Is that for the free credits or? <laughs> yeah, they, they try to get that 100K. Uh, yeah, I, I do think, like, um, to, to some extent, uh, a lot of the enterprises we talk to, like, there's a set of needs that are kind of, like, going to be distinct from, like, the hype cycle of what's, like, cool and what developers like. Um, for instance, like, stuff around, like, uh, access control, like, privacy, security, those things that we have heard. Um, and, uh, like, yeah, for whatever reason, like, there, there's, like, a certain uh, sense of uh, distrust of OpenAI, like, whether or not that's justified or, or not, right? I think it's probably similar to just, like, uh, why a lot of companies are reluctant to move to, like, SaaS-based uh, products in the first place. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, like, uh, a, a lot of them are trying to figure it out. Like, like we are kind of finding ourselves in the uh, position of, like, uh, during these conversations with a lot of these, like, uh, businesses, of, um, like, a lot of these businesses are, are asking for, like, a product, like, an end solution. And um, I have to say, like, you know, we're, we're, like, an open source tool. Like, yeah, we are a company. Um, but, you know, if you want something, we'll, we'll try to build it. But, like, it's not, it's not ready yet, right? But, like, I think a lot of them are trying to approach it from, like, this buyer's perspective. Whereas a lot of the developers at the ground are kind of really tinkering with the tools themselves and seeing what's possible. I'm kind of surprised that so far nobody's really built or started. And it probably exists, and I just haven't seen it as sort of, like, the Accenture or Palantir for helping large enterprises just from a services perspective. Like there's so much services spend in the world, but nobody's really sort of driving that. So that seems like a interesting opportunity if somebody wanted to build a, a, a new type of business there. Um, so I think we um, now are gonna open it up for Q&A from the audience. And so I don't know if there's mics in the back, um, if people wanna raise their hands and ask questions, if not, I'll ask some more questions. Oh, right in the middle. Oh, one second. We'll bring you a mic. Well, he'll bring you a mic. Hi. Oh. I can repeat the question, too. So if you want to ask it, I can repeat it. I'm curious. Um, off type and tuning, what are the, what are, some of the issues they run into. Yeah, um, I, I can jump to that. I think it's just like retraining a model. I think it converges differently as different properties, different data sets, and 
you know, I don't think you can take a data set, take a pre-existing model and just plug it in and expect it to work. Um, you have to redefine, you know, you have to think about loss differently. You have to think about how, um, like what we find is loss is very, very, you know, application specific. And, um, and so I think it's not so much that, you know, it's a specific set of problems. I think it's just that, you know, it's, this, it's not a silver bullet that you can take some, you know, I think everyone thinks about fine tuning, you know, stable diffusion with Laura and thinks, wow, well, maybe I'll get results like that. Um, when you're working with large language models, um, just the amount of variability is pretty high. Um, and it's a bit of a snowflake problem. That's at least what we've seen so far. Yeah, I've been helping out with this company called Brain Trust that Mike mentioned, and we 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 I've been helping out with some of the customer calls. And you call a customer, and they they're just starting to adopt AI, and they start talking about um, fine tuning. And then you talk to them a month later, and they've abandoned that, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we're using like GPT four for some things, and if it's too expensive, we fall back or whatever." And so it's interesting to see the same set of problems sort of keep cropping up as people go down this learning curve, and they all want to do very specific things early, and then. A month later, it's a different set of problems. And then two months later, it's the same, but different set of problems. And so it's this very interesting progression of people adopting the technology. Another question from the audience? Oh, right there, please. I think you mentioned that Danny does have too much coming in and not knowing. So when customers, when customers come to you, what is the general application that they're seeking to solve? Like, what's the general problem? And do you find yourself having to tailor like what you're trying to do to address their problem or convince them that LLMs is not the right approach? Maybe their problem is just logistic regression, right? Um, so ha what's really the landscape out there and why do they say fine tuning? Uh, do they even understand their data or like how do you see the general knowledge out there to sort of, um, yeah, I'm just curious about your day-to-day -day life and like the customers that come to you. We all probably have very different customer sets. So I think we're all going to answer this probably differently. Um, for, for us, I think I'd say there's probably a, like two different categories of, uh, how AI gets injected into, uh, users that we see and serve today. One is we have leadership that is seeing the hype cycle and they're saying, shoot, all my competitors and customers seem to be adopting this stuff. And I'm not, what am I missing? Right? Like, is there actually utility here that I, that I need to go understand? And they're looking for sort of educators, market educators to help teach them and serve them. Hey, you can do this with it, but you can't do this with it. In our case, actually one interesting, funny, weird thing about Zap, we've been around for a decade and we do automation. Like I think the space of AI and automation is like collapsing. Uh, there's not really going to be a very dis good distinction. I don't think going forward. So a lot of what we do is actually just show them what can you use like automation and like what workflows can you actually just sort of like entirely automate. And there are definitely new categories of like types of jobs and workflows that you can do now that would have been really, really hard previously. You know, I think the the biggest one uh, uh, that we've gotten like internal penetration and zappy around is essentially doing summarization of, and it's like a broad use case, but it serves a lot of different departments, but summarization of customer data and then piping that into a daily report that gets sent to a relevant team. So think like you've got, you know, customer feedback for any product coming in from product board. You want to summarize that, dump that into Slack every morning for your product you know, org to be able to see, or you've got, you know, uh, uh, sales leads that you know, in the middle of your pipeline and they're sort of lagging, you want to like summer, you know, create a summary of like, who's lagging, why dump that into your sale SDR channel. Um, see, you can do the same thing for CS. So there's like, we, that's probably the most general broad use case. And a lot of times it's, yeah, it's just educating them about like, what can sort of software take off your plate for you? That way you can give your sort of employees more time back to work on stuff. That's more like business critical. And sometimes that involves, you know, language model. Sometimes it doesn't, but that's sort of what the conversation looks like for us. Okay. Uh, sure. I can, I, I can take a stab. I mean, I think, uh, we like kind of, um, are, are very loud about the fact that we're all about the data. So, so, you know, we're a dev toolkit, Lamindex is a dev toolkit to kind of like connect our data with, uh, language models. And so a lot of the customers or, or not customers, right. We're an open source tool or uh, users that, that use our tool, uh, are using it for kind of like document analysis, like insight extraction, uh, kind of like more custom workflows. to like, for instance, like convert unstructured data into structured data. Um, and then also, uh, kind of like. Uh, load in like unstructured data for like kind of question answering analysis. Uh, and so we've talked to companies in like the finance space, legal space, uh, and, and also like, uh, both like kind of fortune 500s as well as like later stage startups, um, that do have a lot of like utility to kind of like take in a lot of this data and get insights from it. The one thing that this is different than like traditional AI is the fact that like, um, there's something beautiful about the fact that 
you can kind of just like dump in an entire like PDF text into like the GPT info prompt. And you don't really have to do any ETL on top of it to get like get back some insights from it. Right. And and of course, then, you know, the reason Rag exists is because a lot of times this data is way too large for like context windows and you have to like then so set up a software system. But the overall point is that there is kind of like this new ETL stack that's emerging for like data plus LLMs. And, um, you know, our toolkit offers some of that, but like a lot of users also see the potential benefits of this, of just being able to ingest like arbitrary sources of data and getting insights from it. And all extractions, that, that's still a resource file. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's also an active ex uh, area of exploration with like um, kind of LMs too, right? And and you're starting to see some work with like the function API that just came out. You know, it's like both an agent uh, or you can like, it can pick tools, but it, you can also just directly use it to extract like a pedantic object. So uh, agents, um, I think for all the AI practitioners nowadays, they usually start with twinkly uh, testing with the GPT API and then testing uh, land chain, the chains and then the agents and then Llama index and other tools as well. So across the, uh, so for the companies we work at and across the things that you see, what do you think are the distributions of people using right now? Because for, from my experience, it seems uh, for land chain at least, when I, uh, when I tweak on the uh, the agents and it feels like, oh, this is insufficient, I come back to the chains and I, it's all inf insufficient as well. So um, the question is, what do you see are the distributions uh, of apps built using the, the tools that are out there? And uh, where do you see as uh, the biggest opportunities in this? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can take this. I mean, I think, um, let's see. I think there's a difference between what like a uh, developer or, like hacker builds and, and what like enterprises care about. Like, I think there's a lot of hype and noise and it's like justified around like agents. Uh, agent simulations are cool. Um, you know, uh, you have like uh, basically things that go out and have the promise of like literally doing everything for you and, and they can like solve a variety of tasks. Um, I think uh, I've seen like probably slower adoption of that in enterprises. So I might be biased because we literally just launched like data agents yesterday. And so, you know, up until now, a lot of our users were kind of mostly uh, talking to us about like uh, QA and chatbot use cases. Um, but I do think I have seen that a, a bit more commonly uh, throughout like the companies that we've talked to. Um, I, I do think like um, kind of like what the future of this is, um, and I'm, I'm not sure if that directly answers your question, is like some sort of like constrained agents for different use cases. And I think as Karpathy said, like kind of a multi-agent universe, because like, I think it's a very high bar to have like this this one thing that is able to do everything for you versus just like, especially if you think about like an enterprise setting, like task specific agents that can do well on like certain uh, workflows with like a small degree of automation and that they can communicate with each other. And so I think, especially in the data side, you have like, for instance, like a SQL agent or something that can interact with your SQL database and get like structured analytics. Uh, you have another agent that can analyze your PDFs and extract insights there. And I think like um, a lot of, uh, initial companies that we're talking to that started to get into these agents are starting to look at like constrained agent use cases. And I think that does hold a decent amount of promise. Got time for me. Uh, uh, I've been wrong twice already in the last like four months on what products we put in market were going to be like hits. And in both cases, it was the simple product that was almost, almost a wrapper around a third-party intelligence layer. We launched a AI chatbot a uh, feature of our interfaces product that we launched a couple years ago where you can build and embed a very simple AI chatbot with a custom directive. And it's literally a text area. There's no like third-party retrieval. And that thing's been growing like a weed. And I, 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 was, I was shocked. I was like, surely it's going to have to get more complex in order to like be successful in the market. And I think that's like what, that's one of the things I'm getting impressed by is how the awareness bar is for like AI and language models right now, but how low the actual adoption bar is, even for the simpler implementations of the technology. And, you know, it's sort of heretical as it is to say to like a developer conference, but like, you know, I do think pro like the, the sort of distribution is going to play a really, really key part in actually the successful adoption of a lot of these more, even the simple side of the technology right now. Um, so I, I, I don't know if there's like a great takeaway there other than to say I, I i do think maybe the like broad actual adoption of useful ai is very very low uh and there's a long way to go even on the stuff without developing sort of new capabilities on top of the current models okay one last question i don't know if anybody has a mic if not maybe in the corner there hey so you talked a little bit about how engineering roles are changing and i'm curious about uh i think jerry you referred to the difficulty of putting um large cell large scale models into production 
I'm wondering about the changing role of the SRE or how you would redefine roles of you know, basically tech ops in this, like, let's say you're launching a huge large scale consumer application. How would, what, what, what skill sets and capabilities and would you hire for what, how, how would you define the role? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm curious if you have uh, other thoughts on this too. Um, cause I, I think people are still figuring it out. I, I do think like um let's see like before ml or uh kind of like uh, in the non-ml world like you know you you need like sres you need people you have like data dog you you need observability you need monitoring right you have like a fauna you like track like system metrics and stuff um and i think like you know the ml ops world like uh, four years ago was basically just like oh you know like we need a similar staff for ml because these things are black boxes and like uh the difficulty with these things is that a lot of it is data dependent so it's not just like there's deterministic like you can't just observe the inside of it and know exactly what's going to happen uh they're trained on some data distribution you put in some input you don't really know what's going to come out right and so you need like observability for that too and so for a lot of like supervised models before llms like you needed to have like uh, a lot of like companies like uh, kind of building ml in production especially like bigger tech companies honestly you'd be surprised at like how slow most companies are in adopting just like ml in general but like if you look at like google or something like they built their own op stack right to really like uh like validate like machine learning uh, pipelines and so i think for for llms it is nicer in that it's a lot easier to get like any sort of software stack up and running with llms you don't need to build your own like ml pipeline um but i i do think like um there's this point where like well, uh, what they enable is getting you up and running very quickly. But if you are trying to build something with like a high quality bar, then you are going to have to invest in like ops work. Um, there is an argument to be made that for like uh, applications without that quality bar, and you know, like if, if these models are good enough, then yeah, just like ship it. You know, it's whatever. Like, it, like it's not like a sensitive application, and you can get this up and running in like a day. Uh, and I think a lot of people uh, do that, and you know, it's it's fine. Um, but I do think like, uh, for like, there's going to be some like long tail of use cases where like, you're going to need to invest in ops holding and observability. And I think that's exactly where like the evaluation challenges with LLMs lie. Tune, do you want to add? Yeah, I can, I can add on to that. Um, I think that's right. I think, you know, this, this whole observability stack on the machine learning side, they need to build, I think from what we've seen and, you know, we're an infrastructure company, you know, that scales to quite a large amount of nodes at some points and. What we're finding is that there's not that many people um, at the intersection of SRE and running large um, models, um, you know, and in fact, most companies that we've talked to are going to gaming companies um, to go and find infra people um, because they're the only people with a ton of experience with GPUs. Um, and so Uni Unity engineers all of a sudden are um, really, really, pop really, really popular. So... I'd actually say the SRE role is even more important now because the complexities here are pretty pretty high. And but that's quite separate from the ML observability stuff um, there. And I think there's added complexity and honestly a massive opportunity. Um, you know, the reason why people buy our software is because they can't hire machine learning infrastructure engineers, and when they can, mm. they cost you know five hundred or seven hundred thousand dollars. Um, that that is, you know, the math the buyers tell us that they're um, evaluating us again. Okay, great. Well, a huge thanks to our panel. Um, and uh, there's a there's a great day coming. So hopefully, um, people can stick around all the way to the end. Next up, we have um, Stripe with some demos, and then we have a variety of other um, speakers coming as well. So thanks everybody for making it tonight. Thank you.